This is Ellen Shakespeare from the City University of New York School of Professional Studies. Welcome to our webinar series. Today we're going to be talking about uh, maximizing Microsoft Excel and uh, we have a great presentation about moving beyond some of those simple charts and graphs that are available in, um, in Excel. But just a little bit about our program. Um, as I mentioned, this is, we're, we're at the City University of New York School of Professional Studies in um, right in Manhattan, um, but we do have a fully online HIM program. Uh, uh, we are in candidacy at the present time with KHIM, which is the accrediting body for all educational programs uh, associated with AHIMA. Um, we uh, do not charge out-of-state tuition to students no matter where they live as long as they're in a fully online program. And we do have a bunch of fac experienced faculty. Uh, we have faculty experience not only in online education, but we have a lot of great HIM practitioners who are currently working out in the field. Who And not, e not only HIM practitioners, we have uh, public health practitioners, we have a couple of IT folks and whatnot who are working in the field and then are some of our adjunct faculty. So this is a link to our programs where you can find all information about our um, HIM program. I believe if, uh, for anyone that might be interested, the deadline for our spring registration is, or spring applications, I believe is January 4th. Mm, don't quote me on that, but it's somewhere around the beginning of January. Classes start the end of January. We're fortunate enough that our, our um, enrollment is high enough that we're able to offer all classes, all semesters, so that um, you don't get stuck in one of those things where this course is only offered in the spring and this one's only offered in the fall. So, um, so anyway, that's a little bit about our program. Um, I'm hoping to be fully accredited with KHIM by the end of this academic year. We, we've been in candidacy for one year, and um, hopefully that process will be completed uh, by the end of this academic year. I just wanted to mention, too, that we have a master's in data analytics at our school. It's a relatively new program, but as you know, analytics is the hot topic of the day for, for uh, healthcare professionals. Um, the EHR has done unbelievable things to be able to finally retrieve some of that data that we've been using and massaging. Um, now at least we can finally collect it and utilize it. This particular uh, curriculum is not specifically for healthcare, but we do have healthcare folks that are enrolled in this curriculum. And uh, so it's a, it's a combination of people in all sorts of different disciplines. So it's, um, again, an interesting uh, spin on how to use our HIM knowledge. And I hear that since we, uh, since our offices are in down <laughs> Midtown Manhattan, you're going to hear some sirens and and whatnot uh, probably throughout the presentation. So just try and uh, tuck, hope it doesn't disturb you, but just to sort of tuck it in the back of your head there. Um, but I wanted to introduce our your instructor today, Mike Guerra. Mike has had over 30 years of experience in the healthcare arena. Um, he currently uh, is, is owner-operator of healthcarepctraining.com, um, where he provides a lot of training to healthcare professionals, um, all, actually all over the country. And um, we were fortunate enough to have Mike do, a pres do three webinars for us in the spring about Excel. And um, it was very, very successful, thanks to, I'm sure, many of you on the line who attended some of those. Um, and so we continued with Mike for this fall, uh, sort of coming up with some of the ideas that uh, we thought might be valuable to HIM folks. So Mike is your, is your instructor for today, and um, I think you'll find him to be dynamic and fun, and he's very enthusiastic about data. So let me just go to the next slide. <laughs> Right, Mike? You that's, are enthusiastic. That's right. I, am, I am enthusiastic. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> and this is just my contact information. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the academic director of the HIM program. And uh, I've been here at, at CUNY. This is my second academic year. And um, it's really exciting to be working in the city in a, in a large program. We have over 100 students already enrolled in our program. And, but these are my, this is my contact telephone numbers. Feel free to call my work cell. That's my work cell. Don't feel bad about bothering me. Um, and that's my, my office phone number. So I'm turning the mic over to Mike. Thanks, Mike. 
Okay, thank you very much, Alan, and thank you for all the good people here at CUNY who are doing so much to make all of this information available. Um, it is a great day in New York. It is sunny. It's a beautiful, perfect autumnal day. I hope it is beautiful and perfect wherever you are today. Um, we have a full agenda today. We are going to be take, talking about Microsoft Excel from a number of different perspectives. We're going to be talking about some charting and graphing issues. We're going to be talking about downloading data from other uh, third-party sources uh, from the internet. We're going to be talking about moving data between Excel and Access. So we've got a, a very full agenda. Um, as you go through uh, today's uh, webinar, uh, by all means, if, if you have questions, you can shoot them off to us. You can send them uh, to Ellen. Ellen is going to be moderating and pulling out some of the common themes uh, that emerge in questions um, in today's webinar. Um, I will personally answer every question that we get, whether one person asks it or a dozen people ask it. So by all means, uh, do shoot those uh, questions off to us. There will be some time for questions and answers at the end, but we'll also answer questions during the course of the next week or so. So with no further ado, let me talk about uh, what we'll be doing today. Um, of course, all of you have the typical uses for Microsoft Excel when it comes to charting and graphing for those people in the health information management world, uh, the, the typical bar and line graphs that you all do for trending at various types of issues, whether it's um, volume in information, frequency information, um, uh, the number of uh, doctors who have been suspended, um, wh whatever it happens to be. You're all familiar with bar and line graphs, and we'll be talking about those today. Um, data distribution using pie charts, and it seems to me that, that people in the healthcare industry seem to be in love with pie charts. And I think pie charts are wonderful uh, as far as they go, but a lot of times people don't remember that what you're looking at at a pie chart usually is just simply a distribution of data rather than the absolute numbers. And so one has to be very careful about pie charts, but we'll be talking a little bit about that. Uh, certainly people use graphing and charting for productivity reporting, um, doing departmental budgets, um, creating ad hoc charts for administ various administrative reports and purposes, and many others. I'm sure that many of you have been using charting and graphing for many years. And in fact, I'll sometimes be using the term charting, sometimes graphing, but they, in terms of the way Excel uses them, Excel, uh, the people at Microsoft, Microsoft tend to use charting and graphing interchangeably. So let's go first to some important considerations associated with charting and graphing. Uh, these are things that, we, that you really ought to pay attention to whenever you are putting together a chart or a graph for presentation to a larger audience. First of all, why? Well, we all know a picture is worth a thousand words. I know I'm preaching to the choir here. That's not, it's not necessary to be this one to death, but really sometimes we, we, we get caught up in our own uh, perspectives and, and a lot of times, particularly when you are in, in, in an interdisciplinary setting, a picture really does help to crystallize whatever an issue might be for other people from other disciplines. Certainly uh, charts and graphs give us uh, a heightened ability to focus on various trends over time, uh, to quickly compare competing values, whether, whether we're talking length of stay or number of accounts or number of cases or what have you. Certainly, and this is not to be underestimated, maintaining a the user interest in a presentation is really con considerable and certainly using graphs and using charts helps one to do that. And so one ought not to um, may, uh, ignore that, but by the same token, one not to overutilize gra graphs and charts, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through today's presentation. You've got to be very careful about them. The most important thing about charts and graphs is that they tell the audience a story, and all of us, going back from the time we are tiny to the time we uh, are senior citizens and beyond, we all love to hear a story, and that we have to remember that is the real reason for using a chart and a graph. You need to be able to tell the audience a story or express a concept or be able to communicate some relevant ideas and we're choosing to do it in a graphical way. But 
always remember that we're trying to tell the audience a story. So often we just present data for the purpose of presenting data, but we need to let the data speak and let the data tell a story. So those are some important considerations. I don't want to miss those, and, and I want you to think about them as we go through today's webinar as well as your own life. Okay, well, what is it we're going to be talking about today? Let's start at the beginning. We're going to go beyond simple pie and bar charts and graphs. Um, I'm sure that many of you have tinkered around and, and maybe gone quite a bit beyond that, but we're going to move beyond um, some of the simple charts and graphs. I will go over some, some issues related to graph and, and chart construction, uh, but we're going to move beyond that. We're also going to do, we're going to spend a considerable amount of time today talking about creating charts and graphs with multiple axes. And now you may be scratching your head and saying, now why would we need to be able to do that? And I think it will become self-explanatory as we go through. But frequently you want to look at two numerical values in relation to each other, but they have completely different value structures. Um, for example, a, a cholesterol, a cholesterol value can go from zero to, I guess, 400, 500. Uh, you might be looking at an A1C level, an A1C level would go from about zero to 14 or 15, I, I would suppose. And so sometimes we want to look at both of those competing values on the same graph. And so we're going to spend a considerable amount of time today talking about how to perform this because it is a bit tricky. We're going to talk about templating and templates, pre-designed Excel templates. And I'm going to, going to show you a few of those. Um, you can go out to the internet and find many. Microsoft makes many available. Your own IT department might make certain templates available for doing routine types of tasks, submitting payroll data, or uh, doing uh, type, some types of you know, analysis that your board of directors might require. So we'll, talk, we'll spend some time today talking about templates. We're going to spend a considerable amount of time today talking about downloading data from the internet for charts and graphs and just simply downloading data from the internet. Um, I'm fortunate in that I live and do most of my work in New York State and the Department of Health here has a very robust set of data points out on the internet on the New York State Department of Health's website. I'm going to show a few of those, but I'd be willing to bet that your state also is doing some of these same activities that we see done in New York. So even though you may not be in New York, when you see the things that I'll be doing today, I suspect that if you go out to your uh, state's uh, respective state's uh, Department of Health, you too will be able to do very similar types of analysis. The principles are the same. We'll be talking about linking Excel files with Microsoft Access databases. This is something that a lot of people are very curious about, particularly those individuals who are getting to the point where they are taxing the ability or testing the ability, the upward ability of Excel to accommodate enough data. Sometimes people have to graduate into Microsoft Access databases. So we'll spend a bit of time today talking about how we link Excel files with Microsoft Access databases. And then finally, we'll be talking about using Excel's data slicer. It's a it's a sort of an online way of interacting with data in a graphical way um, and in a very iterative um, way, in a very interactive way. So we'll spend a bit of time talking about that. So we've got a full agenda, lots of things to talk about. Um, and as we go through, you'll uh, we'll be happy to uh, do our best to uh, field as many questions as we possibly can. All right. Well, Moving beyond simple pie and bar graphs and, and charts, well, what's involved in that? Certainly, the biggest problem that I see in the development of bar graphs and charts is that people don't typically create and inspect data using rigorous data creation or spreadsheet creation methodologies. And if you've attended any of these other webinars that I've been uh, been through uh, with you all uh, or, or gone to any of the classes that we run, you'll know that I'm always saying that as you develop your data, it's really important to remember that we have no blank columns and no blank rows in the, um, in, in the data. One of the biggest problems that we see 
with, uh, with data is that people insert blank columns and blank rows and when they go to actually perform their data analysis they get results where they got a lot of numbers that don't look like they make sense or a lot of zeros or a lot of NAs and so it's really important when you are creating your spreadsheets that are going to be the source of your graphing and charting data that we have no blank columns no blank rows and I'll demonstrate this in a hands-on way in a few moments as I said before, it's important to understand that pie charts represent distributions or ratios. And so a lot of times presenting data in a pie chart form can be a little bit confusing to users, even though people love to see pie charts for whatever reason that happens to be. We're going to spend some time talking about creating summary columns using the if formula. And I'm going to spend a fair amount of time today telling you exactly how to use this formula. This is one of the most underutilized formulas in Excel and it really helps in creating dynamic charts and graphs, particularly when you're charting continuous variables, numbers from say 0 to 100 or for 0 to 300 or, or what have you. Using the if statement, I'm going to take you through using the if formula, and it's going to show you basically how you can collapse data into categories. And it's a very useful and very underutilized formula. Um, and so that's one of the techniques that I'll be showing you. And then finally, creating pivot tables to summarize data. When we're dealing with lots and lots of data, we, it's very helpful for us to use the pivot table to summarize the data and then graph the summarized results. Uh, I believe we have other um, webinars that we've done previously uh, where we go into detail about the creation of pivot tables so we can reference you to those. Uh, I'll, I'll assume that, that for purposes of our, our discussion today that you have a basic understanding of pivot tables but I'll, I'll show you you how we're actually doing it. I'll take it step by step. And then finally, we'll be creating the graph or the chart. So now, with no further ado, let's take a look at some sample data. Let's take a look at what I've got here. I've got some fictitious data here where we've got the patient's name, their medical record number, what unit they were on, whether they were seen on as an inpatient, and how long they were here, their admission date, discharge date, and so forth. If you look carefully, you see that I'm computing the length of stay in column G. I'm not showing that formula here, but you can see that I'm computing it. And one of the things that's very interesting is that you see that all of these doctors are listed. The doctors, the names look consistent. You see no blank columns, no blank rows. My data is nice and tight. The data actually goes beyond row 23 here. We were only seeing the first 22 uh, patients plus our header. So this is an example of data without a graph. And as I think we would all agree that even though the data may be meaningful, it's rather boring looking at this data, uh, and particularly if you're presenting it to people who may not be completely familiar with it, would probably get bored with it pretty quickly. So let's talk about how we can make this data, make this, this the data that we're looking at more exciting, and how can we make this more useful, and more importantly, how can we make it more amenable to graphing? Well, let's take a look at an example. First of all, there's our data. And now look what I've done here. I've created a length of stay category. What I've done is I've taken my length of stay that you see in column G and I've collapsed it into several categories. And just eyeballing the data, it looks like I've got my uh, patients who stayed one day fall into the category of one. My patients who stayed between two and five days, such as Gene Armstrong, Teresa Bell here, they fall into the category of two through five. And then I've got another category, patients who stayed between six and ten days, and so on and so forth. I could have put a fourth category in of those patients who stayed greater than ten days, although I don't have any in this particular distribution. So what I'm doing here, ladies and gentlemen, is I'm taking the detailed continuous data here, the continuous one through XXX, whatever the length of stay could be, and I'm collapsing it into several categories. And you're going to see in a moment how this ca categorization of my data really helps in terms of letting the data speak from the point of view of graphing and charting. But it is a little bit tricky, and this is where we use that if statement that I told you about earlier. Now you see that I'm translating the length of stay in column G 
to a length of stay category in column H. And how did I go about doing that? Well, I used this crazy formula that you see on the bottom, and it looks like a bunch of gibberish at this point to many of you. But I'm going to take, we're going to break apart this if statement. I'm going to show you how you can use this if statement so that you can, you too can create this length of stay categorization that I've done in this particular category. As I said, it looks crazy, but it really makes a lot of sense as we break it apart. Let me, let's get right to that. Okay, how do we collapse data using the if statement? Again, remember our, our objective is to be able to create a nice graph. So here's the concept. Okay, we're going to begin using the equal sign. Equals, is because it's a formula, if open parentheses if we just like any other formula it's gonna open with a parentheses if the cell that we're referencing equals condition one then we're going to call it category one and then you see the second comma here I want you in your mind to think of that as the word otherwise okay so I begin if the cell meets condition one then what we're going to do is we're going to call it category one otherwise and then we go to our next condition if the cell equals condition two then call it category two and so on and so forth and and then if none of these cat situations apply then we, it becomes category three this is the concept don't worry I know you're probably scratching your head saying what in the world is this guy talking about I'm gonna show you exactly what I mean okay let's translate what I've done into English if cell if the first cell meets condition one call it category one otherwise if the cell meets condition two call it category two otherwise call it category three that's how we translate this if concept into English and now I'm going to show you how we take that and we translate that into Microsoft Excel here's the actual formula okay equals if we begin it just like any other formula if our length of stay is less than two categorize it as one and I have to have that one in quotes and I'll explain why in a moment okay so if the length of stay is less than two we're gonna categorize the patient's length of stay in the category of one otherwise and I'm at this logically I'm here right now if the length of stay is less than six call it categorize it as two through five otherwise if the length of stay is less than eleven call it six through ten and if none of these other conditions meet then call it ten plus and you're probably noticing these three parentheses at the back right I've got one parentheses to open I've got another parentheses to open I've got another parentheses to open and then I've got three parentheses to end and my, my formula. You probably remember when you were in high school that your algebra teacher said whenever you open up a parentheses, you got to close the parentheses. And this, that same rule applies when we're dealing with Excel. And so when we're using the if statement for categorizing the length of stay, we use it in this format. And then what we do is the result, as you'll see on the next page, allows us to break the data each length of stay into one of these categories. Notice that some of the, that the categories themselves are in quotes, and that's for a reason. We want the formula to be, we want the if formula to be able to act upon the calculation here and then come up with a categorization here. Notice 2 5. If I were not to put this in quotes, the computer would get very confused. It would say 2 minus 5 equals negative 3. And we certainly don't want it to do that. So our categories are going to be 1, 1 length of stay, 2, day, two through 5 days length of stay, 6 through 10 days length of stay, and 10 plus. Now that you're probably completely confused, let me go to the actual data. Okay, here's what the pivot table looks like from the data. You can see see that we've got categories categorizations here 0 through 1 2 through 5 and 6 to 10 through 10 so what I'm doing is I've created a pivot table based upon our earlier data what I've done is I've created a pivot table here and what this pivot what the what my pivot table does 
is it allows me to group the information into discrete categories, both by the length of stay categorization as well as, I'm sorry, the, the unit on which the patient um, received service as well as the, the, um, the labels associated with their length of stay. I noticed one little inconsistency I just picked up. That shouldn't say zero through one. It should just say one. I'll correct that in a moment. So let's take a look at how we now will graph that data. We look at our original data. Okay, we see the original data right there and we see the, the various categorizations of the data. And now let's actually go in and create a situation where we graph this data, but instead of graphing all the continuous variables, length of stay, which could go from 1 to 99999, I'm going to categorize, I'm going to graph my categorization of the data in column H. Remember our formula, okay? Remember the formula that's over here, okay, right there is, says, basically says this, and hopefully this will let you get a better sense of how the if formula works because it's real important when we're doing graphing. Notice I say here equals if open parentheses g2. What's g2? g2 is my length of stay. There's my length of stay for the first patient. The first patient, Gene Armstrong, had a length of stay of four days. So if g2 was less than two, call it a one. Do we call it a one for Gene Armstrong? No. No, we don't. If G2 is less than 6, aha, her length of stay is less than 6, it's 4, call it 2.2-5. Give it the categorization 2-5. If we went to another patient here, for example, Victor Brown, if the length of stay, and it wouldn't be G2 for Victor Brown, it would be G4, if G4 was less than 11, we would go, we would categorize it as 6 through 10, which is why Victor Brown has his length of stay categorized as 6 through 10. So this formula here, the if statement, it's, it's a bit confusing the first couple of times that you do it, but as you do it, you'll get it, you'll, you just have to work with it a little bit more. You'll, if you think about it in this concept, if this cell if the conditions for the first cell are met, call it category one. If the conditions for the second cell are met, category two, and so on and so forth. And the last category is always our default category. This will become real important. You'll see how this relates in a minute when we actually start going into the if statement, okay? You can see that I've got my length of stay categorization in column H, and I've got my formula in G in in this would be the formula that would be residing in H2. Okay, that's my if statement. I'm going to now go down and I'm going to create a graph from that pivot table. I'm gonna and that's what the graph would actually look like. I'm gonna take us all through this right now, and you're gonna get a chance to see exactly how we got from that from from that data that you see in the pivot table all the way to a graph that looked like that. And of course, we can make this graph a lot fancier. We can create um, data labels, and we can change the colors, and we can do a lot of different things. I wanted to keep it as, as simple and as, as pure as we possibly could for this particular example here. All right, let's, I'll, I'll, sh I'll demonstrate this. Uh, let me go out to, let me suspend this for a moment, and let me go out to our to my example here, and I'm going to pull up the graphing example that we've got here in Excel. Nope, wrong one. Excuse me. Okay, um, we've got, um, a, well, this is a slightly different graph, but we'll, we, we can do this one nonetheless, okay? Very, very similar, okay? What I'm going to do is we're going to create, a, I'm going to create a pivot table. Oh, actually, I think I already have. I've created a pivot table. Well, let me do that for those of you that may not be familiar with that. Okay, we're going to create a pivot table here. I'm going to say insert pivot table. We, I'm going to choose the data that I want to be able to create a graph from. I'm going to click OK. And now I'm going to say I want to be able to graph information based upon 
the unit and the length of stay right there. And that's not exactly what I wanted to do. Let me go back and find the formula uh, that I wanted to use. That's a little, not quite exactly what we wanted to do. Let me uh, pull up that data. Hold on one moment. Okay. Okay, nope. Okay, let me pull that. Okay, let me work with this. Let What we're going to do, it's a slightly different example. I want to pull up the, I'm um, going to do a pivot table. We're going to cl click insert pivot table, and I'm going to graph, oh wait, oh I'm sorry, I forgot one thing here. I want to categorize my length of stay. I'm going to call it LOS category. Let me just move those to the side because they're visually, they're a bit distracting. And notice what we've got here. I'm going to create my category. I'm going to say equals if, in this case, my length of stay is in cell H2. If H2 is less than 2, the value 2, we're going to call it 1, 1 length of stay. Otherwise, if H2 is less than 6, comma, we're going to call it 2 through 5, quote, comma, if H2 is less than 11, we're going to call it 6 through 10. Otherwise, if, caps don't matter here, H2 is less than, um, otherwise, we're going to call it 10 plus. And notice what I do. I put in my three parentheses. So you can see the formula right up here in the upper left-hand side. Let me center that so it becomes a little bit more visible. In fact, I'll bold in it. So that it... And notice my formula here. I'm saying if H2, the length of stay, is less than 2, call it 1. Otherwise, if the length of stay is less than 6, call it 2 through 5. If the length of stay is less than 11, call it 6 through 10. Otherwise, call it 10 plus. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply copy my formula, that if statement, all the way down so it will categorize all of these, the data. You can see now for every one of these patients, we've categorized the data and we've got a length of stay category for every one of them. Let me put, let me get create one that is over 10 days. Let's, let me put this patient as having been discharged 01-30-13. So we can see that that patient had a length of stay of 29. Let me do that for at least one other patient, 01-29-13. All right, so now, now we're ready to create a pivot table. I'm going to now say insert pivot table. There's our data. I'm going to now take the length of stay category and I'm going to make that my column label. I'm going to take the doctor's name. I'm going to take, put that in my row, and I want to have the length of stay as my values. And you can see now I've got a very nice pivot table right over here, and I'm able to take this information. You'll notice that the 10 plus may be a little bit misaligned. I can move that easily. I can move that and I can move it to the right if I want to. I'll move it one more time to the right. And now our data looks really, really nice. We're now seeing the data. I'm going to center these so that it looks a little bit better. I apologize for the noise in the background. We've got an ambulance going past us right now, I know that some of you may be experiencing noise interference. And now you can see that for every one of these doctors, we've categorized how the data falls. I can now graph that information. I'm going to just simply graph it. I'm going to say insert 
and I'm going to call it a column graph. It will be really simple, and we've got something that looks very much like that. And so the process is really pretty straightforward. I started with this data, okay, and let me color code this so that it becomes a little bit more obvious. I'm color coding. I start with the data. I create this formula that categorizes my length of stay. Rather than dealing with all of these individual discrete variables, which, uh, excuse me, not discrete, continuous variables, I'm translating the continuous variable into a discrete variable, into categorizations. From there, I then took that data and I created a graph that looks like what you see in front of you. And I've got that right here on the, on the, on the basis of the formula that you see. If I said I want to really examine all of the patients in any one of these categories, let's say I wanted to look at the, at the, the, the patients, uh, the, total, the total length of stay for, the, uh, for Dr. Alfred Buford's patients, I can simply double click on the 24 and I see all of Dr. Buford's patients right there. So you can see that cre creating a graph from summarized data is much easier than creating a graph from continuous data like this. It's a, it's a very simple process, but it takes a little bit of complexity. We'll be coming back to this later on when we talk about VLOOKUP and how that interacts with graphs and so forth. Let me go back to our PowerPoint and okay so what we've done is we've created a graph from that pivot table next what I'd like to do is I'd like to deal with the issue of creating a graph from when we have multiple axes now the important thing to remember here is the following let's suppose you've got data that looks like this we're creating a graph with multiple axes. I've got the medical record number. I've got a patient's A1C values. I've got the patient's cholesterol values. And I happen to have some data over here that really is irrelevant to my graphing situation. I really don't, I'm not interested in graphing the, the, the date of admission. I could delete that. I could mark it. I could get rid of it. The thing to, to pay attention to here is when you're creating a graph, excuse me, I'm, I just realized I'm not in, there we go. When you're creating a graph that has multiple axes, the key thing is this. Take a look at my, my patients with my, the A1C range. Their A1C range goes, in this case, from a low of 4.5 to a high of 12.8, whereas their cholesterol goes from a low of 160 to a high of 310. I want to graph both of these values on the same graph, but the fact that, that we have two completely different sets of numbers here can, get, can make things a bit confusing. So I'm going to show you how we can create a graph with multiple axes where we can express both the A1C level and the cholesterol at the same time. Remember, I've got my horizontal data labels. That's going to be the, my patient identifiers, which are going to run across the, the, the horizontal axis. Some people refer that to that as the x-axis of my graph. I've got my data, which is going to be called series one of my, the data that we're going to graph. We're going to graph series two is going to be the patient's cholesterol numbers and irrelevant data, date of admission. I don't have to worry about that. So I'm, my eyes are really going to focus on columns A, B, and C. Remember when you're graphing data in Excel, we think in terms of series, series one, series two, series three. So as we go through each example, what will happen is we each data point is part part of a series and that series is all related to one concept. So in this case, my A1C data is series one. My cholesterol readings are series two. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to go in. You see the, the, what the data looks like here. You see the data on the side going from columns A through B, uh, excuse me, A through D. I'm going to click on insert and I'm going to choose a column graph. Why am I going to choose a column graph? Because it's the most obvious. That's 
typically what I like to use when I'm, I'm teaching this. But you, we can use any of these types of graphs. We just have to be careful about how we use our pie chart, our pie graph. So I'm going to say I'm going to click Insert Column. I'm going to then highlight the data that I want. And look what happens. It produces a graph on the right side of my screen, which is really basically garbage. And the reason that, that, that it's garbage is look at my, my vertical axis here. Look what it's doing. Look what the computer is doing. It's silly. It's actually using the patient's medical record number for computing the y-axis here, the vertical axis. And we don't want it to do that. It's even gone so far as plotting it. It's plotting the, our, our values right over here. And we cer certainly don't want to do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to go, we're going to right click on our screen, on our data, and notice what will happen. When we right click on the data, what it's going to do is our graph, we, we, excuse me, we, we right click on the graph, it's going to prompt us and it's going to prompt us to answer a couple of questions. It's going to ask us where's the data that resides, wh where's the data that we want to graph and the, obviously in this case the data, the data goes from A1 through D8 and then d down here it's going to identify, we're going to identify for each one of the variables that we want to graph what the range is of data. Now we're going to get rid of the medical record number and the date of admission and we're going to use the medical record number in our horizontal categorization. We're going to basically move the medical record number from here so that it does so that Excel doesn't try to graph it to over here where it actually will try to you will use it as the, the patient identifier. Our Axis label range, the, the, when we go into tr creating a chart, you'll see at the upper right hand side, you'll see a tab that says chart tools. And these are really valuable, the design, the layout, and the format chart tools that we're using for graphing this information. It's going to ask us what the axis label range is for our data. We're going to indicate that the data that they it's going to use the, the data from A2 through A8 as our axis. Rather than one, two, three, four, five, six, seven over here, it's going to use the patient's medical record number as our identifiers on our graph. And look what it produces. It produces a graph that looks something like this. Well, this data is okay, but look at the difference. Look at what's going on here. My A1C numbers, they're tiny. The, the red indicates my A1C numbers, and when I compare them to the cholesterol numbers, everything is way out of, out of scale. The reason for that, I'm sure you're picking up, is that our y-axis here goes from 0 to 350 to accommodate this big range of data for cholesterol. What it doesn't really speak to though, however, is this very narrow range of data for the A1C levels. All my A1C levels are down here. We really don't get a sense by looking at this data how the A1C level relates to the cholesterol level because our vertical axis is off. So the challenge that we have here, ladies and gentlemen, is how do we get the A1C data to look like the cholesterol data and how do we get that to graph using a second axis and that axis would be right over here on the right side. Well, what we do is we go into our graph, we right click on that range of data. I'm going to right click on that range of data and when I right click on that that range of data, what's going to happen is the, the, the data is going to appear up here in my formula. I'm going to right click on that data. You see all the data points and what it's going to ask me for is it's going to ask me do I want to create, do I want to use a secondary axis? I'm going to demonstrate this in a moment and notice what happens here. Look at this. This is so exciting to me. The cholesterol numbers are here on the left they go from 0 to 350 and now on the right side I've got another axis that goes from 0 to 14 and that reflects my A1C levels and so you in this case we've got a we're, we're creating a graph that's got multiple axes and we've got these two measurements going simultaneously so let's go do this for real let's let me 
get out of here momentarily. Let me go and we're going to pull up that data. And we're going to pull that data up directly on the example that I've created for you. And we are right here. Yes, here we go. Here's what the data looks like. I'm going to highlight this data right here. And I'm going to say insert. And I'm going to, whoop, OK. So what we're going to do is we're going to graph this information. And what we're going to do is we're going to graph the medical record number and the A1C and the cholesterol number on two separate axes. I choose that I'm going to use a column graph. I'll click the simplest uh, column graph there. You see that what the data looks like here. I'm now going to right click on the data. And we're going to go in and we're going to click on actually uh, better than right clicking on the data. Let me show you something else. You can use this icon up here that says select data. OK, so there's my chart data range. Now what I want to do is I'm going to take my medical record number and I'm going to remove it from the legend series here. And I'm going to edit and I'm going to choose that I want my medical record number to be my axes, my axes labels there. So you can see that I've identified, let me make this graph a, a bit bigger. Okay. And so now what you're, we're able to do is let me pull, make this a little bit bigger so you can see it a little bit better. Okay, I'm going to select my data. I'm going to remove the medical record number from my legend series, my, the, the series of data. What I'm going to do is I'm going to edit and I'm going to say my medical record numbers are going to be, be the identifiers for the patients. You can see their the, the, the axes labels have now been created down below and I click OK there and I click OK here. So now I've still got the problem that I've got my A1C is much smaller. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to right, I'm going to left click my data on the graph. I right click, and this is the tricky part. Okay, I'm going to click on where it says change series type. I'm going to make it into a line graph so that it makes so it looks a little bit more obvious. And I'm going to right click. And I'm going to say, uh, where are we? Select data. Nope, excuse me. I'm going to right click on it. I'm going to click format data series. And then where it says secondary access. You see that series options, secondary access. And then I click close. And there you have it. I've got an axis on my left. My axis on my left shows me my A1C number, oh, excuse me, my, my cholesterol numbers, my axis on the right shows me my A1C numbers. Of course, we can dress this up, we can make it, we can add some titles, we can do all sorts of fun things uh, through the layout and through the format, which I don't want to really get into today, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody understands exactly how to do this. Notice that what I did was when I went, I when I click on, I right click on my data, my point, I then click Format Data Series, and I click on Secondary Axis. If I want to send it back to the primary axis, I can do that. I send it back to the primary axis, and now you can see that the data is down below. Not really very helpful there. I now will bring it back to my secondary axis. I'm going to go back to, whoop, excuse me. I'm going to go back to my data. format that and I'm going to click on secondary axis and you see that we've created the data and now I can get a sense of how the cholesterol varies and how the A1C varies all on one graph. You could do a lot of different things with this. You could certainly do things like comparing inpatient stay in inpatient days against outpatient visits. Um, you could uh, compare um, the uh, procedures, let's say procedures in the laboratory against uh, prescriptions filled in the pharmacy. Anytime you want to look at two numbers 
and get a sense of how they relate to one another. This can be a very useful tool. Let me jump back to our PowerPoint and let me get back to where we were here. So you see the idea of creating a graph with multiple axes and it's not as difficult as it take, as, as it may look. It's, it's a little bit complicated, but I think if you follow the example that we've got here and you follow and you take some very simple data, no, notice that what I did here, I created something of very simple uh, data to, to an analyze. I didn't try to do it overly uh, complicated. If you do it a couple of times that way, then try a couple of examples yourself, I think you'll get the idea of it. I found that this is uh, something that really is uh, very useful. The thing that you have to be sure of, though, is when you present data that look, looks like this, when you are presenting data that looks like that, you really have to bring your audience along and make sure that the audience understands exactly what it is they're looking at, which is why you might want to label each of these axes and be really careful about that. Okay, let's jump back to our PowerPoint. Uh, enough of multi, uh, dealing with uh, graphs with multiple axes. I hope you're able to uh, get through that and, and feel comfortable with that. We're going to shift gears now and we're going to move away from charting and graphing specifically and we're going to talk about something that's related to charting and graphing, but it's the whole area of using templates. and. Templates, you've probably heard about templates from time to time in Excel. They're a very useful aspect of, uh, of using Microsoft Excel or any other spreadsheet because you can set up data in a very structured way and hopefully those individuals who are using that data, you can replicate tasks, procedures, what have you, and, and you can control the data in a very structured sort of a way. Now, there are three different types of templates that we talk about. One are called installation templates, which you might download from a vendor, uh, from an, a consultant, um, and you actually install these templates on your computer. Another is what's called a download template, and a download template might be simply a, a template that you download from Microsoft or you download uh, from one of your colleagues and, and you structure the information uh, that way. Or personal templates. You might create some templates of your own uh, that are going to be used for uh, the for, for your colleagues or for something that's repetitive. We tend to use Excel templates when we are using data that is going to be repetitive, something that we might be doing every week or every month or what have you. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, typical uses of templates are in managing routine processes, um, controlling and managing data input. They're really helpful here because what you're able to do is you're able to control exactly what the user are putting in um, and, and create all sorts of uh, error messages and so forth and they help you to develop standardized forms and these standardized forms can be useful in uh, completing routine tasks. Okay, so let's talk about how you might open up a template and by the way if you um, own Microsoft the office, guess what? You already own a whole bunch of templates. If you go into Excel and you click on File and then you click on New and you click on Sample Templates, you're going to see a whole bunch of templates down here. Agendas, budgets, calendars, all on and on. And this is real, this only scratches the surface. This is what actually comes bundled when you buy Microsoft Office. There are many, many other templates that come that you can download from Microsoft, uh, that you can download from other users. You've got to take care in downloading templates because they may uh, create uh, untoward events on your computer. You've got to be careful. You've got to use all all the caution that you would in downloading any other document or what have you. But remember, the purpose of a template is to be able to create something again and again and again, to, to, to create a standardized procedure for doing something. So using templates, for example, there one, one template that you might want to use is something that we've got like this blood pressure tracker that you see right over here. Um, this, this is a, a, a template that, it, that comes directly in uh, Microsoft 2010 and that, I'm going to show you how to use that one or how to, how to actually download, not to download it. You can download it, click on it, it will save. I don't think you have to worry about that, but once you download the data, what's it going to actually look like? Well, it's going to look like something that you see on the right. When I click on 
blood pressure tracker and I pl click on create, it will physically, it will actually download the template to my downloads area on my computer and it will have something that looks like this. Now where did this come from? This one happened to come from Microsoft, uh, but you might get it from a, a medical school or from a researcher or what have you. And when I downloaded this template, what it gives me the ability to do is to create not only to put in a patient's name, but to give a target blood pressure to identify who my the physician is, who the physician what the physician phone number is, and to be able to create a structured input for my data and indicating what day what the date the blood pressure was done, what time, what my systolic and diastolic measurements were, what the heart rates are, and I can put in some free form comments here. So you're free to download this blood pressure tracker yourself. It's a very good one to to play with and to get used to using a template. There are several several others. Uh, here's one uh, that I downloaded. Again, I think this one came from Microsoft. I'm not positive, uh, but this is something that I thought people in the HIM department might be able to use. It's an employee scheduling template. And you can see that I've got my employees over here. I got myself and I've got Ellen yeah, listed here and I've got one of our colleagues listed. And all I did was I put in my week ending here here and buried inside of these templates are formula formulae which enable us to well, which when I input that the, what the, what what my week ending date is it will fill in all of the days going across here it will also allow, allow me to input what shift each uh, each employee is working um, I can see that uh, that I worked um, let's see on Monday Tuesday Monday the first shift, Tuesday and Wednesday the second, then I went back on the first shift on Thursday and then I was sick on Friday and it will enable us to indicate how many hours the patient were, or the employee worked and so forth. So this is a, an example of a template. What I would suggest doing is downloading it. You can usually go in to templates and you can modify them in the same way that you would modify by any other form um, or any other spreadsheet. You just have to remember that a template, instead of having a file extension of XLS or XLSX, it usually will have a file extension of XLT, and the T refers to template, so that they don't get auto, um, erased by accident. Um, templates can be a very useful way of doing any kind of things that you're going to be repeating again and again and again. When you're creating, when you're using templates like this, you just have to be careful that, in fact, they are doing everything that you want to do. And every template has some weaknesses. For example, in this case, I can't have, if a, an employee were to go home early in the day, what the designer of this template has done is has assumed that the, the person's data could be filled in all on one line. And so that would be a weakness of this template. Um, if I wanted to put the, if the employee worked six hours and then went home two hours early and was using that as sick, this template wouldn't accommodate that. So you've got to think through exactly what you're using it for. Um, templates can be very useful, um, but they can also be problematic if you don't understand all the formulas uh, that, are, it, that, that are in the uh, template, but they're relatively easy to use. What I would encourage you to do is um, download a couple of templates, and then if you have any specific questions on how a template works, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, it's best to just start with uh, da downloading some simple ones and then creating some of your own on the basis of those templates. Uh, templates can be useful, uh, but they can also be problematic. You've got to be careful about them. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit now about creating graphical data from downloaded internet-based data. What do we do in um, it, when we're downloading data from, from an internet-based uh, source? Well, I'm lucky. I live in New York State. The New York State Department of Health has a very robust set of data. Of course, I've, I've got to decide what is my question. And lucky for me, the New York State Department of Health has this ro a robust database that looks at cardiac 
procedures, angioplasties, calf, and open heart procedures. So what I did was I simply went out to the Department of Health's website in New York. I'm sure your state has its own website and you probably have very da similar data uh, relative to either cardiac or um, uh, pediatric immunization or mental health issues or what have you, you can probably download information uh, as easily as I was able to from New York. And, and this is what, a, what the screen looks like. I can see that uh, I, I've selected in this particular data that I want to get cabbage data, coronary artery bypass graft surgery, and I want to get it for the New York metro area. I don't necessarily want to see all the area. Uh, all the areas in upstate New York, and I can actually see here in some hospitals, maybe some of you are, are working at some of these hospitals, hospitals in the New York uh, City area that uh, had open heart, proceed, uh, open heart programs and the year 2010, which I think is their most recent um, d data. Now this is not uh, patient-specific data, this is summary data only. So I've identified in this case the data that I want to bring down. I'm going to uh, the, the, the New York State has given me an export routine and it asks me do I want to download the data as a CSV file, a JSON file, I'm not even sure what a JSON file is, a PDF, an RDF file, any one of these various formats. I happen to choose an XLS file. If you're bringing data from an internet based system down into Excel, you're either going to want to use the XLS, one of the XLS options, or the CSV, comma separated values. I find this to be sort of the universal way of downloading data. The problem with comma separated values is that sometimes you'll see things that will uh, like the leading zeros may be dropped, some problematic issues. So you could bring the data down as either a CSV file or as an XLS file. I brought it down as an XLS file. The New York State Department of Health gives me an option that tells me do I want to open it, do I want to save the data, and it, act, and it gives me the ability to name the file. In this case, I named it Cabbage Procedures New York City 2010. I could have called it anything I wanted to call it. Um, and then once I pulled the data down, it looks just like an Excel spreadsheet. Take a look at that. Amazing. I've, I've uh, dressed up the column headings so that it, they look a little bit more, uh, a little bit clearer to you. But I can, but I, I now have what is essentially an Excel spreadsheet. From here, I can do any kind of graphing that I've done before. I can pick out by hospital or by a borough, you know, by uh, what we call boroughs, most of you all call counties um, out, out there in the, on the left uh, in column C, uh, I, what type of procedures. Now this happens to be isolated coronary bypass graft. If a patient had a combination bypass graft and a valve procedure, they would be excluded from this list and how many cases and so forth. And it gets real interesting here. You can all uh, go out to that website if you have interest in, in that particular information. But the point that I'm trying to make when I go back one is that you see that the data that I've selected when I go back two, I've selected the data to come down in an XLS format. I've told the data, uh, I've told Excel, uh, my, my computer to open it up as an Excel file and I've pulled the data over and it looks exactly like what you've seen here. In some cases, you might have to cut and paste the data. In some cases, you may have to go out to an Excel to uh, to your website. You may have to highlight it and then right-click, copy. I shouldn't have said cut and paste. I should have said copy and paste. Then go into Microsoft Excel and right-click and click uh, paste or paste special. Um, if you paste special, it may create a link out to that website so that if the data is changed on that website, you may be notified that that data has been changed. But it's usually pretty forgiving. When you pull data down from the internet, in most cases it will come across either as a formatted file, meaning an XML file, or it will come across as delimited data using commas or quotes or what have you. You may have to clean up the data a bit, but I find that as uh, individuals become more and more used to working with downloaded data that looks like, like that, they become more attuned to using the various tools that Excel has for downloading data and for reformatting the data to make it look 
some, similar to what you would like it to look. Um, if any of you are having difficulty, I'd encourage you to go out to, to New York's uh, website. Um, I believe it's um, ny.health.us.gov, uh, but you can find that easily enough. I am sure, and and pull down the data. The data there is is extraordinarily easy to pull down. Hopefully, your state has something similar. And I would love hearing from any of you um, about uh, ways that you have used internet-based uh, data for pulling information down. Once I've got the data downloaded, I can create a lovely graph. And what have I done here? I've created a graph with one single axis. The axis goes. You can see that my Vertical axis goes from 0 to 350. That's based upon this column here. It looks looks like what Excel has done is it said, well, uh, Lenox Hill Hospital seems to be the highest volume here. And so it's created a uh, vertical axis going from 0 to 350 with the names of the hospitals going across here. I dressed, whoops, excuse me, I dressed up the graph a little bit. I gave it a little bit more of a fancy title. I made a simple bar graph. You can get the, you can play around with that as you need to do so. So you, hopefully you'll be able to pull down data and you'll be able to work with data in a very straightforward fashion. I see we've got about 20 minutes left. I've got a, quite a bit more left to go through. We'll get, get through as much as we can in the time that we can. And whatever we don't get through, we'll record and make sure that you do uh, get the, uh, the full program. Um, let's now shift gears again and talk about how we can automatically update data in Excel from Microsoft Access. One of the beautiful things about Microsoft Access and Microsoft Excel is because they are both developed by Microsoft, the linkages between the two programs are really, really tight. And this is particularly important, uh, particularly true when you get to Excel 10, uh, 2010 and Excel 2013. All the examples you've seen today are taken from Excel 2010. But in fact, it works even going back to uh, some of the older versions of Excel. If any of you are on Excel 2003 or earlier, uh, the connections work pretty well there. Now, what I've done in this example is I've created a, a, a database where I've got my information in Microsoft Access. I've got a list of all of the doctors who have on suspension from my, from my uh, hospital. And you can see that my data he, down here is called suspension list link to Excel. I just called it that to make it nice and clear. And you can tell that my data is in a Microsoft Access format. Okay, even though all my files here are Excel, we're going to link to this, that, this file called suspension list link to Excel. What I do is I click file open and then instead of saying open my Excel files, I open my Access databases. I'm going to click where it says all, and instead of all files, I'm going to click Access Databases, and that will allow me to open up this file called Suspension List Link to Excel. Once I've opened that up, what it's going to do is it's going to tell me that this file exists. It's going to highlight the file name for me. And then what it's going to do, if you, were, if you are familiar, pardon me, with Microsoft Access, you'll know that Access stores its data in both tables and queries. So we can actually click directly on a table. I've got a table called providers, a table called chart review, a table called providers and chart review. Um, I've got my tables here and I've got queries established. We can link from Excel to either queries or to tables directly in Microsoft Access. It's really fantastic. I then, once I click on, I, I'm going to click on where it says providers. I'm going to click on my providers there and then look what it does. It brings the data over. It brings my provider data over directly into Microsoft Excel. I did nothing, ladies and gentlemen, to this data. I just simply set it up in Microsoft Excel, excuse me, Microsoft Access. I clicked on that link and it brought the data directly over based upon the table. I've got my provider number, my provider name, what their credentials 
credential was and so on and so forth. You can see that it's pulling the data over. And so what Microsoft Excel does is it basically sets up a linkage, a linkage between Excel and, and Microsoft Access. You click on that linkage, you pull the data over, and when you pull the data over, it will then refresh the Excel spreadsheet that you've created. If, in fact, I've added additional providers in Access, Excel, Excel will ask me whether I want to update with the new providers. That could be your choice or not. But the point that I'm trying to make is that we are able to pull information directly from Excel, from Access directly into Excel. Now you do have to be careful because this, these provider numbers are unique in within Access, and so you can't create, you can't change these in Excel, then upload the data back to Access without creating some problems. But in point of fact, where what most people want to do is they want to pull data from Access into Excel, and what I demonstrated here is exactly how you do that. You find your file in Access, you indicate in Excel that the data is in an access structure. You then highlight the file that you want to bring over. It will then open up that file, provided that no other users are in it, by the way. You then select, do I want to, to pull over a table in access, or do I want to pull over a query? And then it will pull that information over very efficiently. It's a very easy process. Again, what I would encourage you to do is to try it on your own, to try it, and as you go through it, to try it on some very simple data, some data that you really know really, really cold, and then as you pull the data over from Access into Excel, see what it does, and, and you work with it in Excel, and then go back to Access, update the data in Access, and then try to pull it over again and see if it will refresh your data in Excel. Sometimes it will overwrite the data in Excel, so you may have to save the file in Excel using the save as routine. So for example, if I was pulling over provider data on October 15th, I might say provider data dash 10, 15, 13. Then if I did it again on 10, on October 16th, I would save the data as provider data dash 10, 16, and so forth. The linkages between Excel and Access are getting stronger, and I have no doubt that um, at some point in the future uh, we'll be able to uh, do almost seamless linkages between Access and Excel. All right, we've got a few minutes left. Let's jump into something called Excel's Data Slicer. Now, you're probably wondering about this. You probably heard about it, but not known exactly what it is. Uh, but we're all familiar with that phrase, slice and dice the data. It sounds like a lot of fun, doesn't it? Well, the slicer lets us do exactly that. What a slicer does is it allows us to essentially create a relationship between the data and once we create this relationship between the data, to interactively create a, a a graph based upon tables, which are based upon spreadsheets. Now, what I'm going to do in this case is we're going to use the VLOOKUP to assign a group to each physician associated with our data. We're going to create a pivot table, which summarizes the data. We're then going to create a graph, which describes the data, and then we're going to slice the data in user-defined groupings. A lot of times people want to jump right to that slicing, but really to get there you have to kind of go through a process. It's kind of like baking bread. You got to mix your ingredients, you got to knead the dough, you got to spread it out, you got to let it rise, and then you got to bake it. You can't do everything all at once. And using the data slicer, I think you'll see in this example how I go about doing that. Okay, let's begin. Let's take this example here where I've got the data we've been looking at all day long. I've got the doc, the, the patient, medical record number, so forth. I've got the doctor, but now I want to be able to slice the data based upon not the doctor, but what group the doctor was in. And so look what I'm going to do. I'm going to take in columns J and K, I've got my group 
my doctor and my group name associated with each doctor. And in column E, we're going to set up a formula that grabs, in column E here, we're going to set up a formula that grabs the group name based upon the doctor's identity. So for example, John Smith. We see John Smith here, and we see John Smith here, and we see that Dr. Smith is a member of the West Side Pediatrics. Okay, so I'm going to put in a VLOOKUP formula in my group column that is going to say compare this name here to all of these names here when you find a match of the name in column D with the name in column J, go over to the second column, grab the group name, and move it over to column E. All right, take a look at this. What we're doing is I'm taking the group name and I'm putting it over here using this formula. And notice what my formula is in E2. It says equals VLOOKUP D2. J2, K7, 2, comma. Let me translate this into English, okay? Look up the value at D2. What's D2? John Smith, Dr. Smith. Look it up in this range, in the range starting from J2 through K7. Try to ignore those dollar signs momentarily. Take the, look up the name held in D2 John Smith, look in this range from J2 through K7, so that's over here, K, J2 through K7, and if you find it, number two, you see this number two, grab the second column. Well, what's the second column of that range? The second column is that group name. So when I, and that, la, that last zero means do an exact match. So when I'm pulling this formula over, when I create my VLOOKUP, it's going to interrogate column D, it's going to then go grab the information, it's going to compare column D to column J. If there's a match, it's going to grab the group name and bring it over to column E. I hope I haven't confused you too much. And look what happens. Lo and behold, my VLOOKUP works perfectly. I can see Dr. Smith is a member of Westside Pediatrics. There he is. I can see Dr. Jones is a me member of Westside Pediatrics. I can see Dr. Buford is a member of the Chelsea Family Practice. There he is, Chelsea Family Practice, and so on and so forth. So my first step is in the, using the slicer, and I didn't have to do this, but I thought it would be a useful way of comparing because I know HIM people frequently have to look at data, not only by individual provider, but by the group. Okay, so we're looking at, so we, we pull the data over using our VLOOKUP. I now create a pivot table, which you're all experts at now, and what does my pivot table reveal? My pivot table shows me how many patients I had in each one of the groups. Okay, Manhattan Internal Medicine had 13 patients, Westside Pediatrics had 14, and so on and so forth. You can see my pivot table there. I now then go to the top where it says pivot table tools, I click options, insert slicer. And look what insert a slicer does. It basically allows me to filter my data interactively. I click insert slicer. It asks me, it asks me which fields do I want to slice. And in this case, I want to slice the data by group. I then click OK. It will say which field do I want to use using Excel's data slicer and look what it did. It creates a slicing tool right over here. It shows me all of my individual groups and it allows me to go in and turn these, turn these on and off and as I turn each of these on and off the and I should have done a demonstration. I'll put it in the uh, the presentation we put at, out on the web. But when you click each one of these individual slicers, slices, it will show only that slice. So I can look at Chelsea Family Practice, or I can look at Manhattan Internal Medicine, and so on and so forth. I might want to look at three of them. I want, might want to look at all of them. I might want to look at only one of them. So what the da data slicer basically allows us to do is to take the data that I've summarized in a pivot table and then slice it 
and display it individually. I'm going to now turn the agenda over to my colleague Ellen Shakespeare um, and ask her in the few moments that we have left to um, uh, let me know if there have been any common themes in the questions and as I said earlier you're welcome to send any uh, individual questions to me at mgara at healthcarepctraining.com. I want to thank you all for participating in this webinar. Ellen? Hi, I'm here. Thanks Mike for a great presentation. We do have a question here that I'm trying to go back here and locate. Okay, this is going back to um, originally when you were creating formulas and whatnot. So your formula said if um, if the length of stay was less than 11, this is way back sort of there in the beginning, yep. Yep, I'm and um, then place in category 6 to 10, right? But 4, the question is, but 4 is less than 11. So how does Excel know to put it in the 6 to 10 uh, instead, of, put it in the two to five instead of the six to set ten category. Yes, that is a excellent question, and the way it knows it, let me show you. Okay, if you look at the bottom, you see where I've got that formula. What Excel does is it considers everything on the basis of the idea of has it already been ruled out. So in this case, the length of stay. If the length of stay is less than two, call it one. So what Excel is now doing is it's saying if, if one is already dealt with, then just move on from there. Then it says if this it, length of stay is less than six, call it two through five. So now we've taken care of all the ones. We've taken care of everything with a length of stay up through five. If it doesn't qualify for any of these, then continue going. So basically what Excel does when it's creating a formula is it moves left to right. And as it moves, once, it, once something qualifies, it then categorizes it on that basis and then it continues, which is why as you move over from, from left to right, it then will exclude um, the, 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 the cases um, going forward. I can re refer you to both a website in Excel and in Microsoft and, and a more thorough explanation that I've written, but basically as it moves from left to right, it excludes values. So thank you again, uh, everyone. I really appreciate your coming. I appreciate your engagement and um, look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Thanks again.
Um, I did have um, a couple other questions, and people are asking about how to um, how to get the presentation going. You know, after after today, and so just I, I will let everyone know. And I think I did put it also out there in the question area. But um, what we've been doing with our webinars is we are creating a a, a link to our CUNY SPS YouTube channel and you should be receiving an email probably tomorrow with a link to our YouTube channel so you could watch this presentation over again and and listen to Mike's lovely voice <laughs> and, <laughs> and um, additionally I believe we have been um, provi uh, providing copies of the uh, PowerPoint and um, some examples we, we didn't really have any data examples you didn't really have any examples specifically today for today um, that, yeah. uh, in a workbook format, but um, typically we will email out all of this information to you. And thank you for correcting my. <laughs> I don't know if everybody can see that, but um, but anyway, so that's what will happen with our the presentation. And everybody, there got a few. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question. So the minute something qualifies, oh, this is going back to that same. Um, question Mike. So the minute it qualifies, something qualifies in your um, formula, then it goes on to the next record. Is that, that is right? correct. That is yeah. correct. Um, wonderful webinar. Thank you, presenter, and everyone involved in getting it going. Um, and I, I think, um, think that's it. We will be having another. Um, Webinar coming up, I believe it's on November. I should know this off the top of my head, but I believe it's November 14th. Do you know, Mike, if that's the date? I, um, I believe that is the date. Yes. November, uh, well, I don't know, maybe November 12th because that's a Tuesday. So um, <clears throat> we do have the third um, series in this particular group of webinars. Um, I'm really hoping to put on some again in the spring. So if anybody has some ideas, feel free to email me directly with that. Uh, with any ideas you might have for webinars. Um, but again, I believe you see on the screen my contact information, uh, Ellen Shakespeare, and here's my phone number, my cell number disappeared, but um, you can reach me either at one of those, those um, uh, contact places. Uh, again, Mike, thank you for a wonderful presentation, and as some of the participants have also said, and thank you very much. Oh, wait, let's see. Somebody else said something. Uh, November 19th. Okay, everybody's correcting me. November 19th is the next webinar. <laughs> um, and yes, all of the previous presentations are all on the YouTube channel, and you can find our um, presentations. Uh, if you go to YouTube and you search for CUNY SPS, that's how I usually do it, Search for CUNY SPS, and then once you get there, search through the CUNY SPS webinars. So I usually put in HIM or um, um, HIM Excel. So there's some, you know, you should find all of the webinars. You have to kind of look around a little bit, but um, shouldn't be too hard to find. So there were three in the spring that Mike presented on Excel. We had one last month and then um, today. So you should be able to find all of them at our uh, YouTube channel.